Hello. This is a section I've added lately on ASIC costs and capabilities. I'm going to give you examples of high-end standard ASICs, introduce you to the concept of low-end standard ASICs built in legacy nodes, and give a couple examples of gate arrays and FPGAs talking about capabilities and cost. Part of the reason I added this is because I often see students using the uh, charts that you just reviewed as a hard numbered decision tree. And these, of course, are not hard numbers. Uh, for example, on this slide, I mention FPGAs are slow and I say less than 100 megahertz. You notice all my numbers here are uh, order of magnitude sorts of numbers. I had an exam where I said 100 megahertz exactly, and someone said, well, your FPGA can't do that uh, because you say less than 100 megahertz. These are not hard and fast numbers. I want you to use your engineering judgment in the types of exam questions I have about what type of uh, implementation is best suited uh, to an application. So first, let's look at high-end standard cell ASICs in advanced technology nodes. An example from today is the uh, NVIDIA Maxwell GPU. Uh, this is characterized by a large number of transistors because you can get a very high transistor density with the advanced technology nodes. These are very fast transistors. And when the transistors switch, you get low power, that is low dynamic power. So for example, the, uh, the top end of the range for the Maxwell GPUs uh, operates at a bit over gigahertz, uh, can deliver 4.6 gigaflops, uh, teraflops, uh, has a lot of onboard memory, uh, several hundred K of, of SRAM, and has a lot of logic gates, a lot of transistors, uh, 5.2 billion transistors in a very large chip produced in uh, the current high volume production advanced node at 28 nanometer. So let's look a little bit about at, at how much this uh, so that this uh, device can cost. Before I do that, just notice uh, the very large number of transistors, the very high uh, capability of this uh, in this advanced node. So these are meant to be very enough numbers. Uh, I don't even know the actual numbers, uh, 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 but uh, th these, these are a very rough approximation. So these are built in 300 millimeter wafers. The uh, yielded uh, wafer cost would probably be about $4,000, plus or minus quite a bit. <laughs> uh, the uh, number of die that are made per wafer, these are large die, 145 die about. Uh, because they're large die, there's a reasonable probability they'll fail. That is, there'll be a production defect in them. We'll talk about design for tests later, which is aimed at detecting production defects. And uh, you might get about 50 yielding. This gives a cost per yielded die of about $80. Um, in contrast, the cost per transistor, per yielded transistor, is 10 microcents. Add together packaging cost, uh, margin, of course, and, and you get the sales price. So these are the recurring costs, the cost per chip once you get into high volume production. What does it take to get to that high volume production? Well, the mask costs alone to make the lithographic mask is in this technology node is around $4 million. And that's just to get the mask. There'll also be a large design cost. I don't have any data as to what that is for this chip, but, but, but it'd, be, it'd be substantial and large. Of course, we've got Moore's Law operating, so we have a continuing uh, uh, advancement in technology node. This is not one reason why the numbers I give earlier uh, in the pre preceding section are only intended to be orders of magnitude because, of course, you've got Moore's Law marching on underneath all those numbers, adding new capability with each technology node. So not too long ago, NVIDIA announced the next GPU, the Pascal. This uses a 16 nanometer FinFET technology, which we talked about earlier, and has 17 billion transistors on it. Uh, that is um, uh, uh, roughly four to five times more than, than the Maxwell. It uses 3D stack DRAM. Uh, how that is done is we put th uh, through silicon vias, through thin DRAM, stack these to create what's called a high bandwidth memory. These are then packaged on what's called an interposer, which is high density wiring layer, to connect these very wide buses, uh, this 1024IO to the HBM, uh, to the NVIDIA Pascal chip in the middle.
Here's a very approximate cost estimate just for the Pascal chip, I'm not dealing with the package or the HBM memory. Uh, at uh, uh, 14 nanometer, the cost per wafer would be very roughly $10,000 possibly. Uh, you get about 145 die per wafer, less than half of those were yield, yielded a, a, giving a yielded cost per die of $150. The cost per transistor has gone down somewhat to 8 microcents, not a huge reduction, but still a, significant redu still a significant reduction. This is, of course, a defining characteristic of Moore's law. The cost per transistor keeps going down. This, of course, is at high volume. To get to that volume, you've got to spend a lot of money, though. Just the mass costs would be roughly $10 million. And, of course, the design costs are also high. Now, not all markets, of course, justify these enormous upfront costs. Uh, you need to be addressing a large market, and you need a large design budget. In addition, there's a lot of products that are not suited to these advanced technology nodes. These advanced nodes are more digital in nature. They're aimed at, at, at maximizing the transistor density, that is, minimizing the cost per transistor for only digital transistors. If you have a lot of analog content, you don't really get that advantage. Analog transistors actually don't shrink a lot. Uh, and also, uh, these advanced nodes don't tend to have very low standby power. The transistors are small, so there's uh, some current leakage in them, uh, more so than at a legacy node, uh, and thus when the, when the device is mostly off, you don't get quite as low standby uh, power. So for these reasons, uh, there are alternatives to uh, the, the, the cost of structure I was describing for the NVIDIA products. Of course, you can use smaller die in an advanced process. I uh, still support the mass cost, uh, but this is actually a viable option, particularly for a largely digital part. If you're in low volume production, you can share the mass cost with others, uh, depend, depending on how many people are sharing a, a, a set of mass costs, you can substantially reduce your, your cost of making those masks. These are called multi-project wafers. Uh, and there's a number of organizations and even a lot of the fabs that run multi-project wafers to allow smaller companies to do small volume, uh, relatively cost-effective uh, digital production in these advanced nodes. Another alternative is to use a legacy node, and this tends to be particularly true when you want analog functionality or, or very low standby power. This is typically in the 45 to 180 nanometer range, sometimes even up to uh, 350 nanometer. Uh, the 45 and 65 nanometer nodes are particularly good at analog. Uh, these, these other older nodes uh, are particularly uh, cost effective when you have a small amount of digital uh, on your chip. And all of these tend to be very low leakage transistors and thus give you low standby power, particularly these older nodes. So the bigger the transistor, the lower its leakage current. So here, let's give an example of a product at, at this end of things. Uh, here we have an RFID chip. Um, it's a, uh, say it's 2 by 2 millimeters, typically built in a 150 or 180 nanometer technology. Uh, very low power consumption, uh, and of course, uh, uh, very, you want very low standby power. Uh, in fact, you, you essentially have zero. If the RFID chip is not going near, near a reader, it's not powered. Uh, but you've got, to do, you've got to be able to power the chip and exercise it with the very low power of an RF-delivered field. Example, of course, is a clothing tag. When you take it uh, past the, the door of a, of a store, uh, it, uh, the, the, the detector there detects the RFID chip. So in these legacy technologies, the wafer costs are very low. Uh, and the reason for this is uh, because uh, it was lower at the time to build the fab in terms of total cost. And in addition, all that cost has been amortized. Uh, so so you, you've, you basically already paid off the fab. Uh, just like your living costs go down when you pay off the mortgage of your house. Uh, these legacy nodes are often 200 millimeter wafers. Uh, of course, a very small die will give you a very large number of die. The yield tends to be very high for these small wafers in these legacy nodes. So the cost per yield of die can be very small. But no, this works out to this example, and it's really only an example, uh, works out to 3 millicents per transistor, quite a bit higher than the microcent per transistor range uh, that you get in uh, the advanced nodes. Thus again, if you're largely digital, need a lot of digital transistors, uh, you are actually all better off in the advanced node. 
The mask costs are much lower, 150000 so the cost of designing and building a first set of trans uh, devices is, is relatively low. Here we give an example of gate array from Triad Semiconductor, not far from here. Um, uh, you'll notice here it talks about uh, particular analog functions that can be implemented on the gate array. There's a general purpose analog tile of uh, various transistors, which are connected up by uh, a, um, the mask programmable layers. Here's some details of example of a mask programmable layer, or even just the via programmable layer, where you just program where the vias are in order to connect up whichever of these transistors you want to produce your functionality. Uh, some characteristics of these, um, they have, don't give you a lot of logic gates. Again, this is not terribly suited to large digital product products. You quite often have a, a lot of fixed functions available to you. Uh, here, for example, uh, it's an 8051 CPU and some USB ports uh, just sitting there on the chip. Thus, often, gate arrays are useful to you if the gate array vendor provides a gate array uh, pre-made with the features that are, you actually need. If you can't use the features that are provided, gate arrays tend to be less suitable for you. It has various interfaces here. Um, uh, uh, I squared C, uh, uh, CAN for vehicles and so forth, and of course SRAM and EEPROM. Some analog functions are built into the chips, and again, uh, uh, these are very useful to you, these gate arrays, if they provide the analog functions they need. If you need different analog functions and have to do it in the general purpose analog tile, uh, your effective density goes down a lot. These of course have very low NRE, you're only supporting uh, the one or two masks, not a complete mask set, uh, and, and, and thus have the lowest barrier to entry there. And we've already talked about the recurring engineering cost being closer to legacy standard cell ASICs, but not quite as good as legacy standard cell ASICs. Let's turn to FPGAs. I'll start with the low-end FPGAs. Uh, I particularly chose here the Xilinx uh, Spartan range. Uh, you can see here uh, if you can read this, uh, magnified if you can't on your, on your, on your personal copy, uh, 3,800 to 147,000 logic cells for system level integration. So this is the general purpose logic that's available to you. Uh, these are configured as lookup tables. Each of these have uh, two flip-flops. Thus, in the, high, in the top of the Spartan range, you might have, you might, you might have up to 300,000 flip-flops and a small multiple of that of, 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 of gates, a few hundred thousand gates. So compared with the uh, billions of transistors we were looking at earlier for the NVIDIA GPU, this is not a log lot of logic, but more so than the gate array example we just gave. Of course, there's a modest amount of memory, a few megabits, uh, and there's embedded processors, uh, some uh, 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 FPUs uh, uh, and, and things like that. And we'll talk a lot more about uh, uh, FPGAs and the features on them in, in a later class. The cost for these, even in volume, is quite high. Many tens of dollars per device. Um, you know, to, to build 3 billion transistors equivalent, and you have about 4 to 6 transistors per logic gate, um, out of FPGAs would be a lot of FPGAs and would be very expensive. Uh, and probably very hard, if not impossible, to build. So building something like the NVIDIA GPU would be very difficult with an FP, with, particularly with these low-end FPGAs. Of course, you can go to higher-end FPGAs. There's the mid-range uh, Vertex range. Cost goes up quite quickly. Uh, these run at $8,000 per chip or so. I have up to 2 million logic cells instead of the uh, 100,000 or so logic cells. Uh, so you, get, you can get an order of magnitude increase in digital density uh, is still only um, a few million uh, logic gates or a few million digital transistors equivalent. Uh, and these, you can see, are, are very high cost and, and there's really no savings at volume here. Then there's a the very high cost ultra scale. Uh, these costs aren't discoverable, at least on the web. Uh, so I just put it roughly here, greater than $10,000 per chip. Uh, more logic cells, more features, more memory. Uh, but still nowhere near approaching the capabilities of the uh, Maxwell uh, product we uh, talked about earlier. So that brings me to the end of the supplementary section. Uh, here I looked at digital performance, highest in the advanced node standard cell ASIC, 
quite small relatively in FPGAs. Low standby power, that is low transistor leakage, is best in the legacy node standard cells, though the gate array products can be good as well because uh, they're actually built in these legacy technology nodes. In advanced nodes, it's hard to get low standby power, but if you're more digital and do lots of creative things, uh, clock gating and so forth, uh, sleep transistors and so forth, uh, you, you can approach it. Dynamic power, that is the switching power when you're doing uh, logic transitions. We'll talk about this later in, in, the, in the power section of the course. Uh, actually, standard cell ASICs are the best here, uh, followed by legacy node transistors, and the FPJs are worse by a significant factor, 10x or more, uh, in, in these power numbers. Analog capability, the standard cell ASICs are the best suited for many analog functions. Some analog functions can be built in these vast transistor nodes, but they're difficult to build and difficult to design, so, so increasingly people are avoiding them. Uh, gate arrays, of course, are very highly analog, but the functionality is fixed. Uh, largely, there is a general purpose transistor array, which gives you some modest capabilities, but really you're best off if you can use the fixed functions provided with the gate array. There are a few analog-like functions in FPGAs, high-speed I.O., uh, phase-lock loops, and so forth, but not, not much. Non-recurring engineering cost is the highest for standard cell ASICs, and of course, lowest for FPGAs. In contrast, the recurring engineering cost, particularly for digital, uh, is the reversed. Uh, so this is, uh, I hope you enjoyed this supplementary module. Uh, I hope this was useful to you. Thank you very much for your attention.